I am going to now take this opportunity to introduce our panel. And I would like to invite the panel. Uh, and first of all, I want to introduce Amina Elahi, the moderator of our panel. Amina is a reporter at Blue Sky Innovation, where she covers Chicago's startup and innovation ecosystem. She writes about a variety of topics, including Chicago's top entrepreneurs, the way public entities use technology and data, and the social challenges faced, facing this community. She's a graduate of Northwestern University Medical School of Journalism. So with that, Amina. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about our panel this afternoon after hearing so much about uh, what you all are working on, I think we should be able to expand on that with this great panel. So I would like to invite our panelists up. Simona Rollinson, CIO for Cook County. Carmen Sandu, the Managing Deputy CIO for the City of Chicago. Kirk Talbot, CIO for Lake County. Uh, Rick McGaughy, Regional Sales Director for AST Corporation. And Cynthia Herrera Lindstrom, CIO at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So I was thinking it might be nice to start off having each of you briefly introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about why technology is important to what you do specifically in your role and why you're interested in perhaps pursuing uh, public-private partnerships and improving what you're doing with technology. So I'll start off with you. Thank you. My, uh, my name is Cynthia Herrera Lindstrom. I'm the Chief Information Officer at University of Illinois at Chicago. And uh, I have been there 29 and a half years started as a student working in the technology field when you know you could read the screen going by at 300 baht. Uh, and uh, I have seen technology change and the rapid change of technology, the disruptive uh, uh, technologies that Rick was mentioning before. And you know, technology is everything, it's everywhere and you really have to embrace it or you're going to be left behind. Um, I think in, the, in, this, in, tech, in government, um, and I include myself in it, is we are behind the times in treating technology as a tool that can give us an advantage. And the reason for that is we have a monopoly. So hey, we are the ones that provide services. You like it, you don't, you know if this website is good or not, you're still stuck with that one because that's the only place where you can go. So I think our, our responsibility is to treat the customer in this case, the citizens, as customers, and provide the same services that they expect from a company, they should get them from government as well. So we have to evolve. We can't treat ourselves as a monopoly. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmen Sandu. I'm here to represent the city of Chicago. Uh, big job. Um, I will not talk so much about technology for a minute. I'm sure that we'll have some questions surrounding that. I wanted to talk about the public-private partnership. I think that the public-private partnership comes naturally because we all have the same goals. We want to accelerate the, the economic growth of Chicago. We want to create jobs. We want to improve our communities. And we want to make Chicago a technology hub. So. Uh, when Mayor Emanuel came in in 2011, we put out the first technology plan ever. And that was an action call for our technology community, basically saying, hello everyone, we want to strengthen the technology innovation ecosystem for Chicago, and we want to improve our residents' future. So that's in all of our hands, and that's why it's going to be easy. So far, uh, the city of Chicago has uh, collaborated and is, continues to collaborate in a variety of areas. And I'm going to just scratch the surface. If I leave anyone out, please uh, forgive me. Uh, civic technology communities, we engage with over 25 different communities. Community service organization, over 200 community service organizations. Academia and national labs, we engage with startups, we engage uh, with the corporate partnerships, and I'm not talking just through uh, direct vendor partnerships that provide service for the city, but think about the fact that over 50% of all the enterprises in Chicago have a volunteer program, which folks in within that particular organization donate their time and their funds to improving our community. 
directly. We have a strong commitment to minority and women-owned businesses. We have strong partnerships with our uh, government partners like the Cook County, Simona sitting right next to me, um, and also other municipalities. We exchange ideas and information with other municipalities to learn from each other's mistakes. And last but not least, uh, philanthropies. We work with um, MacArthur Foundation, uh, Knight Foundation, uh, Bloomberg, etc. Um, so I strongly believe in the power of the technology community to change the life of every resident in Chicago. As long as we are working together, we are going to make progress. We have made some progress, but there is definitely still work to, to be done. So GTF has the, the right idea um, and is going to increase the impact in our communities. Thank you. Good afternoon, Simona Rollinson, Cook County. I see a lot of familiar faces. If, you, if we haven't met, please stop by, let's, uh, let's meet afterwards. I was sitting in your seat only a year ago. After 17 years in private world, I, I made the transition to the public sector. And it's been an incredible experience. Um, when I started, I was always saying, you know, there is a lot for me to contribute. You know, there is a lot for us to, to, to do to transform uh, government to work as a private business. Now, a year later, I also claim that uh, there is a lot for the private business to learn from government. And uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. But of course, innovation in technology is uh, crucial. Um, and I'll give you two numbers, and I'm sure you'll remember them. In the last two years, President Preckwinkle has committed $77 million in capital expense to, to technology. That's a huge number. So 30, 37 million last uh, budget cycle and 40 million uh, dollars in the cycle before that. So um, obviously, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We believe innovation in technology will help reduce cost, improve operations, and um, improve services to the citizens of Cook County. Just like uh, most governments are challenged with uh, bringing value to our citizens, so are we, and we believe technology is uh, key to it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rick McGahey. Um, I am the regional sales director for AST Corporation. We are a local Oracle implementation firm. Um, I want to thank the committee for inviting me. This is actually my first event here. Um, as part of my duties, though, I act as the project executive for the largest uh, collaborative government implementation of ERP in the United States right now, which is happening in Hillsborough County in the city of Tampa, Florida. So for those of you who don't really understand what I'm saying, that's like Cook County and the city of Chicago trying to implement ERP at the same time together. Only on a little bit in Florida, of course, where it's nice and warm. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, um, as far as this, uh, this panel, um, you know, very excited as a citizen. We obviously want our services faster and we want to pay less taxes. So anything that can come out of the discussions that we have and probably some of the things we're going to talk about in the questions we can ask is how do we improve that? How do we make things better for everyone? Um, I've been working with government for over 25 years, as you can tell by my gray hair. And so I've seen a lot of different things from the state level, the local level, and also the city level. Thank you. Thank you again for having uh, me here. My name is Kirk Talbot. I'm from a little bit farther north up in Lake County. I think our IT budget is closer to what Cook and uh, Chicago spend on batteries in a year. <laughs> a little bit smaller. It allows us to be a little nimble, though, and that's one of the things I enjoy about it. Um, classically trained as a computer science and ling uh, as a, both a computer science scientist and a linguist. So I've always been fascinated at um, the opportunity to translate between cultures and worlds. Uh, certainly technology and business needs a translator. That's how I ended up as a CIO. But I spent uh, a better part of a decade in the private sector consulting and in uh, business operations for IT. And then I spent the second decade in government. 
And like uh, my colleague here mentioned, government is quite a few years behind in terms of the private sector, so it makes it a low bar for success. You can do some basic things, and it's considered innovative and amazing. So I like having low expectations. But I do see phenomenal potential uh, for those people that can translate between the cultural world of government and the cultural world of business. They have radically different success drivers, and uh, the people that will succeed will be the people that understand how to bring those two successes together so that everybody wins in the partnership. Great. Well, thank you for those quick intros. Uh, I want to jump right in and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you face. Obviously, a few of you talked about the fact that you're behind, you want to catch up, maybe even get ahead. I don't know if that's too much to ask for. but. What is standing in your way? I would love to hear from, perhaps Carmen, you could start us off. What are some of the biggest obstacles in your way? And, and then maybe some of the others can respond to how we might overcome them. Um, I think one of the most um, challenging things is keeping um, staff engaged and keeping talent um, engaged for, for a long period of time. So staff retention, I don't think it's a uh, challenge specific to government. I think it's it spans across all areas. However, that sorry, this thing keeps going on and off. Uh, one thing that I think that we are uniquely positioned to provide at this point in time to our staff is engaging work, um, exciting new things to do, things that they can not only say I have actually. Uh, partake in making a difference to my my community, but also having something that they can personally take uh, satisfaction in from a level of technology that they get access to. Um, I know some of my colleagues said we are a little bit behind. Yes, in some areas we are a little bit behind. However, City of Chicago, I feel that is on the um, competing edges in some aspects. So in terms of analytics, in terms of uh, big data, I think we are right innovative, right, quite quite on the accelerated level. Uh, we are one of the most um, engaged um, cities. And I think the greatest reason for that is the fact that we have an engaged community. We have people that care. There is that Chicago pride that we need to tap into and bring them in and make them tra translate into um, technology projects that we do and bring in those people to work for us. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat what Carmen said. Ditto to everything that she said, I'm going to add a new uh, challenge. Um, which is uh, we have a very complex business. We have a lot of projects. I would say um, the strategy is the easy part, even though you know the strategy, everybody would say the strategy is more important. Execution in government is challenging because we have a lot of competing priorities. It's very difficult for us to say no. Who do I say no to the medical examiner or to the sheriff or to the clerk? It, no. Of course no. not. <laughs> So um, in, in order for us to execute and hit milestones and be on, on time, on scope, on quality, and all of those things that we, we know we should be, we need, um, we need you. We need to work very uh, closely with our vendor partners. And you need to be easy to do business with. And maybe I can elaborate on this a little bit later, because again, we have big challenges from cybersecurity to legacy technology to disaster recovery to implementing new applications to integrated property integrated justice and just to name a few things that I'm doing day in and day out and uh, obviously it's key for us to be able to execute better I'll add a third challenge Okay, I'll add a third challenge that um, I, I totally agree with the other two. I don't think we're limited in terms of our challenges. But one of the things that I've seen from both the inside and the outside is that uh, it's a cultural challenge. The things that make government successful, conservative, reliable, um, uh, slow, methodical, typically, are not the kinds of things that make technology innovation successful. 
And so to be successful at a technology partnership with external nonprofits and for-profits, and even other government agencies for that matter, requires swimming upstream against a culture that is not typically found in government agencies. So I think we have to figure out how to uh, work within the government culture, but also extend and create a culture that'll breed success. I, I would like to add to uh, ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, but I would like two things that I think make um, some of the things that we want to do challenging. One is the procurement code. It makes it really difficult to work with innovators that are small places. They don't have the infrastructure to respond to the mind-boggling RFPs that we put out. Um, I think that's a, that's a challenge that um, thwarts innovation. The other one is uh, risk, risk aversion. Uh, because we are a taxpayer organization, we are not very keen on taking on projects that may fail because that does not look good. And unfortunately, when you innovate, you have to be able to go after the thing that it may or may not work, um, but when it fails, then it looks bad on you because you have mis misspent uh, taxpayer dollars. So I think we have to change a little bit of that culture and see how we can include innovation and take risks without looking like a failure when it may not work. Definitely. It's interesting that you mentioned that, uh, as, as they said in my introduction, I am a reporter at the Chicago Tribune's Blue Sky Innovation section, and I report on startups, innovation, technology. Um, so I'm talking to people in the world that you want to be working with all the time, and one of their favorite phrases is fail fast. You should embrace failure, you know, let it happen, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and, and get back at it again. But it seems like in government and for companies that are trying to work with government, that is not really easier, maybe even possible to do. I wonder if any of you could comment on that and how we might fix that. Um, one, um, one very small way that we've um, attempted the city of Chicago to uh, take calculated risks, um, and I want to highlight and underline calculated risks, um, not lightly, um, is through pilots. Um, introduce uh, the concept of testing out in small uh, pilots any new technology, any new idea, and if that is a success, then implement it as a large project. So that is a calculated risk. Another way that uh, we're doing that is by opening up the data. So we have, you know, 36,000 students. Uh, all of many of them very eager to uh, do things better than we are doing it. So by providing access to the data, uh, so for example, we implemented a bus tracking system. Well, one of the requirements was that the, the system that we implemented had an open API so that the students could go in and do something better than what we did. Um, so I think that's where you bring some of the innovation. You, you make something available and then you open it up. And I think the city of Chicago has done a wonderful job with data. They have all sorts of data available. So you can just go in, go at it, you know, and, and then you can bring in that innovation and the risk and the failures that didn't cost you, that, that, that were not a significant amount of money. I sell it, I don't, uh, no, kidding. <laughs> Um, you know, I always say that uh, in government, some of the things that, uh, that I deal with is that, you know, the procurement process is extremely long. And when you take a look at technology, by the time the city or the county or state, whatever it may be across the United States, goes through, and especially the larger, more complex the project is, the further behind you're actually buying and implementing a version of whether it's software, hardware, whatever it may be, that you're already behind the curve. And that is, you know, one of the things like they were talking about. If there was some way to do a pilot, a calculated risk, that you could then determine, okay, this is gonna work, this is not gonna work. The challenge that I see is that, and this is what I talk about a lot with my clients, is that in government, you're all the same. You have an input and you have an output. It's everything in the middle that's different, and that's where the challenge is, and because every part of the United States and every entity has different, unique components that it needs to provide for for its citizens. That was it. Maybe take a little bit of a different view on innovation. Again, 
I spent a lot of time in private world where innovation in technology is um, quite different than, than in government. So um, I believe that technology is not the issue. In government, just like in the private world, you've got to innovate in something different, in the business model, in policy. So in order to be successful, I believe we need to look at the ways to do that in a systemic way rather than on a one-off way. So for example, if we want to integrate the justice systems, there are 38 different exchanges point to point between systems from the jail management to this to the other. What we are doing right now are af under the sponsorship of, of the President Preckwinkle and, and uh, Honorable Dorothy Brown is we, sound a, we signed a memorandum of agreement. You have to put effort on the front end to make sure that you address all the risks and the issues. But once the policy is set, it opens um, doors to innovation. So I just want to leave you with one parting thought from me. So in government, innovation is not just in technology, but in policy, and it needs to be done in a more systemic way in order to be more sustainable. Thank you. Does anyone have an example of a public-private partnership that they think is awesome, that, that the rest of the group can learn something from and that you wish your organization could, uh, you know, uh, resembles somewhat. Actually, um, working at various government agencies, I've had the, the good fortune of participating in two that were really uh, noteworthy. One was um, different parts of the U.S., but one was in a transit agency in which uh, we realized we wouldn't be able to nimbly develop the applications and the ways to consume the information that the citizens really wanted fast enough to keep up with the technology. So we took that step back and we said, okay, we're in the business of producing the information, but we're not in the really the business of distributing the information. So we worked with a non-profit agency that, or a not-for-profit organization that, that took our data streams and made uh, transit systems available via text messaging. This happened eight to ten years ago, and it happened because we were able to step back as a government agency and realize what our core competency was and what we weren't good at, and then open ourselves and get out of the way of that space. Once we did open that data up, it, we then had multiple partners that did it, uh, both for-profit and non-profit. Uh, another model they thought worked really well was we had an opportunity called a grant fund that came down where the money was available. And if we didn't find a good way to spend it, we were going to end up, as I like to joke, it was DHS money, uh, spend money to put chain link fences around chain link fences so that someone wouldn't steal the internal chain link fence. We said that didn't make a lot of sense. It'd be a waste of taxpayer money. But we were, we were stuck. We had to spend that money on a security-related project. And we, didn't, we couldn't see a way to do that. So what we did is we opened up, it was a radically different procurement process. That's why I think it was of note. We opened it up, we pre-qualified some uh, for-profit vendors, brought them in and said, look, we've got a pile of money. We need to spend this in a right way. How should we do it? The, ver the vendors participated, blew us away with their uh, capabilities. What they ended up producing was an ability to deploy uh, live video cameras, full motion control, uh, anywhere in our property, and we had over 100 miles of real estate that we had to manage. It was a railroad. Uh, but they were able to deploy this technology in an afternoon and be able to provide real-time video surveillance anywhere in the county. Um, but it was something that we never would have come up with until we reached out to that vendor space and said, here's the problem, help us find a way to spend the money. It's becoming clearer and clearer to me that procurement and selling ideas into the government is difficult. And so I wonder if any of you could shed light on what are some good ways, I mean, you just gave an example, but what are some good ways for non-government entities to bring ideas forth and um, you know, prove to you that they would actually be worth taking a chance on? I'd like to start with one. One thing, kind of, it's in combination to what Kirk said in kind of the last question. Um, are any of you familiar, and if the city or the county uh, forgive me, of hackathons. See, I, I don't know if the word they're doing them here. So, okay, so I know that um, that some of the ones that I've been in, um, you bring in, you know, some of the best and brightest. You have corporate sponsors for the prizes, and you lock up the college students or you know, innovative young people, whatever it may be, older, it doesn't really matter. And you give them a set of data from your system that's been cleansed, and they go through and you have different issues and problems. You have a committee, and they go through and they develop in 24 hours different applications that really work. 
that the government can then take and implement quickly. So that's one th area that I've seen a lot of around the U.S., and I'm glad that we're doing it here. America and others, we partner. Yeah, I mean, CTN, we've partnered with um, a bunch of other. And also we, we yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, so I was going to, to change the, the conversation more about uh, also working with internships and professional development and, and bringing some of those uh, ideas within government because we have to train our own people as well as create opportunities for college students and, and high school students like partnering with CPS and partnering with um, universities to bring interns um, to help with our project, but also have a, you know, I mean, you indoctrinate them early and hopefully they get a good taste that you can uh, do a lot of great things and they're exposed to great projects in government. We have um, the senior students, especially in engineering, have to do a senior project. So again, we throw out the problem and they come up with a solution and at the end of the day, we have a few choices uh, to do. And uh, hiring the students, I mean, we. We are a great source of employment for students in the university. We give them, um, that's something that they will have in their resume, in their experience, but they are a great source of uh, ideas for how to do things better and different. When you're considering uh, being innovative internally, how does that differ from when you're trying to be innovative externally, when you're trying to do something out in your community or something like that? How do you approach those two scenarios differently? I don't, I don't think that they're necessarily differently. I think one has a procurement issue that you have to deal with, the other one you don't. Um, but the problem on how you go about solving it is basically the same. I mean, you, you have to find the right partner to work with, whether it's internal, you know, the students, or you have an external vendor. Um, I think the, the way that you go about it is about the same. I mean, there's a problem to solve and then you find the right partners to, to work with you. One small addition to um, is microphone apparently several um, one uh, one way that we um, try to engage directly with the external customers in our case the constituents the residents are our end users uh, so I think uh, one way to do that was actually engaging with some um, some of the nonprofits such as the the cut group um, if you are not familiar with the cut group there are uh, groups that um, are made up of residents and within our community that will test an application before it goes live and provide you direct feedback. So that's a way of receiving feedback directly from the residents before an application is being put out there for their usage. Another way of receiving direct feedback from them, and we are looking at that more and more as we are implement as we are looking at implementing our new 311 system it's actually receiving their ideas and their feedback surrounding the functionality of that application before actually putting that application in the in um, we had uh, the, the city of chicago has a portal it's called chideas.org uh, in which we solicit direct feedback from the residents on a variety of topics and um, technology being just one of them. So that is one, one example of the ways that we try to uh, solicit input directly um, from, from an external innovative approach. Um, I think that the end users are going to be the best position to tell you what they really want and tell you how they're going to be use, using a particular piece of technology or process. And uh, similarly, in within our internal processes, we're trying to figure out ways to simplify our processes, including our procurement process. Um, however, um, some of the rules and regulations are put in place for a reason, and those are to best steward the, the, um, our residents of taxpayer money. 
in order to innovate, you gotta listen. So that would be my advice to everyone, including, of course, new CIOs. You gotta get out of your office, you gotta talk to the businesses, what are their internal businesses to the county, what are their business problems, what are their processes, what are they trying to solve, whether it's a permitting issue, whether it's putting GPS in a snow plow, whether it's a new system that medical examiner is putting because he's trying to, you know, cut three hours from the processing time. You gotta really get up close and personal to the business processes in the county internally, but also of the citizens, obviously, and hopefully our businesses are extension to our citizens. So I use our businesses as proxy to our citizens because obviously, I can't increase the surface area between my department and the rest of the world so much, but we use the experts in the individual business, where it's uh, tax, where it's revenue, where it's uh, um, the clerk's office. They need to know their businesses, the, the business of the, of the courts, the business of the sheriff, the jail, and then obviously we take it from there. Um, and that's how you uh, innovate through increasing the surface area with the business and the, ex the external world. I think one of the uh, differences that I see between innovative, innovating internally versus externally is one of scale. When you go external, as we've mentioned, there's greater public risk, there's a perception risk. Um, if you innovate internally, you can potentially affect internal processes that don't take the same level of scrutiny. It may not have to go to the board. It may not have to go to a department head, depending on the nature of it. Um, one of the advantages and disadvantages to being in county government is you have so many different lines of business. We have nearly 30 lines of business that we support. And the reality is each business has different drivers. It has a different culture. Um, and some of those are very recalcitrant to change. So they're not the ones that we go to and talk about innovation. Others are right on the edge and they are eager for change. So we try to approach the internal departments that are eager for change and see how we can work with them because it, it ends up moving faster than when we do uh, an innovation that is purely external. What are some of the traits that you see in those departments that are more poised for innovation and how can we spread that to some of the other departments? I would be foolish to name which departments are. You don't get to sit in this chair by being a fool. Um, or maybe you are a fool to sit in the chair, I'm not sure which. Uh, I would say the ones that are very heavily constrained, that have a lot of legal structure around them, be it state, federal, uh, uh, county, maybe potentially municipal. And again, I won't name them, but afterwards I can hint at what they rhyme with. Um, Whereas there are some of the others that are almost more uh, for-profit-like. It's not that they're trying to generate a profit, but they operate. For example, I'll give you a positive. Uh, public works. It's a utility, right? They bill for their services. They're much more like a private sector department than some of the ones that are operating a service for the citizens purely at taxpayer costs. So looking for those departments that look more like a private business that are very well contained, don't have lots of legal constraints on them, that allows them to move faster. And to your point, the ones where they're not necessarily a monopoly, those have to innovate and move faster. Um, I'm just gonna give a, a quick example of something. Um, we're working right now with the city of Detroit. Um, I think all of you know what kind of happened in Detroit with the bankruptcy and the, the takeover by the state and things like that. What they're doing right now and what a lot of the, uh, the country is watching is their transformation. And, and I'm lucky enough to be able to work with uh, some of the folks there in changing you know, the business processes, changing their overall structure, and then as they go through and emerge out of this time frame, they're going to be a new improved government. Now, what's going to happen after that, I can't answer that, but we're trying to make sure in the vendor community that we don't let them fall back into um, some of the things that they fell into before. Uh, so it doesn't directly answer the question, but it gives you some idea of, of what other areas are, are looking at. And, and we obviously don't want Cook County or Chicago in that. As a, as a taxpayer in both Cook and Lake County, I don't want that to happen. And uh, I pay a lot of parking tickets to Carmen's group, so I'm good. <laughs> I mean, it's simply put, you know, it's towards progressive leadership. You, you know, you, you really respond, like my team responds the way they are managed by me, I respond the way I am managed. So it starts from the top. You gotta have progressive leadership in the, in the line of business, in the agency, and then things uh, fall better. And of course, if there are statutory and regulatory limitations, obviously there is a layer of headwinds and complexity, but by and large, you know, 
we can't implement technology for the sake of technology. You, you don't want to jam it in because it just defeats the purpose. I don't want to be anywhere where the business is not driving. I mean, it's doing the service to, to the taxpayers if we are driving innovation from a technology standpoint alone. It needs to be driven from a business standpoint. I completely agree with Simona. Um, the value is what is going to drive the, the any technology implementation. So working with various departments to find out what really they need is what is going to be um, where we're going to move next. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Uh, no, I agree, and, and I agree with uh, Simona in, in that you set the example by what you do internally, and you can't go and innovate with another unit when you are stuck in the 80s. Um, and I agree with Kirk, you take the unit that you think it's apt and ready for innovation, for changing the way that you do things, and then you use them as an example. And you, you want to have on the head of that somebody that is really gung-ho about it, because then they will be your, your uh, advocates, right? They will go and talk to everyone else about the wonderful things that you did for them and how everything was improved. So that's the kind of folks that you want to get started with, because that's a win, and then the other ones tend to follow. Absolutely. Well, I think we're going to open it up to the crowd. Does anyone have a question? All right, I'll come back. I have a question about uh, project management methodologies. Is uh, is any of the uh, representatives of the uh, government there, are you using any formal project management methodologies for execution of uh, the project? I know execution has been mentioned as a, um, as a point of interest. And if so, what are the experiences? Yes, we are using formal project management methodologies. Uh, depending on the type of project, we use both agile and waterfall methodologies. Um, Internally, we have a PMO group. I'm particularly proud of having a formalized PMO office. They are my lifeline. Obviously, we have a formal dashboard and milestones because you got to know where you are. Otherwise, all, all roads will get you there. So, but from an external standpoint, we do not dictate to our partners, you are our partners, what methodology you're using in your shops, because obviously it's your prerogative. Uh, we're working with you and uh, we have milestones, deliverables, and uh, how you run your business and uh, how, what you've adopted is uh, up to you. Anyone else? Ditto, I guess. Uh, Well, I would say we're a recent, not a recent convert to, but um, we're recently established a PMO within Lake County. And I'd say it's a lifeline, it's critical to success. Um, what we found though is uh, strict adherence or religious adherence to a specific methodology doesn't always work. Situations change so quickly that um, we often find ourselves tweaking the methodologies. Um, and in fact, one of the things we've done internally is we've established, Gardner calls it bimodal or two-speed IT. Um, we've established a group within our group that focuses on very rapid uh, implementations of low risk, high value uh, activities. And in that space, they almost have to innovate on the, the methodologies as well because it's moving so fast. But it's very positive. Yeah, talking from the plus business, uh, business model, what I think it could be more beneficial is in government to make more efficient is to have a subject matter expert from industry, well-known industry area, and streamline the process to the point where all these procurement documents and RFK and all these things are moving in government layer by layer, uh, probably make a quicker decision through have a people with a subject matter expert from different industry. I think that could be more beneficial. I know the PMO process and everything is fine and dandy, but if it doesn't really move fast enough, then you know it's gonna be bogged down as kind of a risk. So I think you probably should consider giving, you know, hiring some well-known people in business subject matter expert to expedite the process. And I totally agree. Um, that's why we are working with you as an extension to our staff. It's easier to do that on the projects around the infrastructure. I mean, obviously, you are the experts. That's why we need your expertise on voice over IP and designing disaster recovery or having a tier three or four data center or whatever we need. We put the SLAs. As long as we have ability to 
to talk, you know, you can, you can help us do those things. It's more complex on the business side. Um, Cook County, we uh, collect and print $12 billion. We've done it uh, on time and uh, in the last two years. So um, I'm particularly proud of this. Maybe it's not a big deal. It's, it's the barrier of entry, but it is a big deal for a lot of the, the um, local folks that are waiting on the money to be able to pay teachers. So anyway, I'm a little bit uh, deviating here, but what I wanted to say is we have a complex tax law. And we have many people that are working on this. We have an assessor, we have a recorder of deeds, we have a clerk, we have board of review, and we have a treasurer. We have five separately elected officials, elected by the people. So they have their individual processes that fit into each other. So for, we need them to play together in the sandbox to come up with a new integrated property. And that's why I talked earlier about policy. So subject matter expertise is one thing, yes, you want to optimize the process and maybe we can re-engineer the process to, to cut steps, but where the true innovation will come is if you look in a more holistic way from end to end through the whole tax generating process. And that, that's a bit of a complexity to bring somebody from the outside that does not really understand tax law in, in Cook County. Um, just one thing that I've seen um, uh, kind of experimented with is um, where an organization, a government, did bring in outside independent people who were experts in the field. And like Simona said, they came up with a decision on a solution, but it didn't fit the needs of the government because they didn't understand what the government actually did. So, I mean, it has been experimented with here in the U.S., I can tell you that for sure. I would like to say we have 3,500 experts on campus <laughs> called faculty members. Um, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It depends. Um, some of them think they know better because they know the uh, nitty gritty details of the academia part of what you're trying to do. And it's like, no, it's like question is much, much simpler than what you think. You're going down into the weeds and that's not what we are asking. So sometimes they can be very beneficial and sometimes they think that they know better. All right, well, I think we're out of time, so I'll run back over here. But uh, thank you again to the panelists for sharing your knowledge and insight.